we can start with Eric. Uh, Dandavat Pranams Maharaj, uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, so my question is regarding uh, some things I remember uh, that you said in an answer to a previous question on last week's call regarding uh, distinguishing between psychological ego and uh, ahamkar, the metaphysical ego, and how it's important to keep the psychological ego healthy so one can make spiritual advancement. So uh, sometimes I've heard uh, some acharyas within the Gaudiya lineage speak in apparently disparaging ways about themselves, uh, you know, famous uh, examples being from Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami, uh, and sometimes Bhaktivinoda Thakur and some of his bhajans. Um, and from what I've heard, you know, this is an outpouring of the extraordinary degree of humility that such exalted Vaishnavas have. Um, however, I also remember hearing a while ago from some devotees in the Sangha that uh, humility isn't supposed to be so much about thinking less of or disparagingly of oneself, but thinking of oneself less uh, often or some, something along those lines. So in relation to this, uh, the aforementioned statements of Bhaktivinoda Thakur and others in the Gaudiya lineage, uh, it's kind of hard for me to understand how the those two can kind of go together or be harmonized. So could you please... Uh, clarify these points and explain how aspiring sadhikas can aspire uh, can apply this uh, principle of humility in a healthy and sustainable way according to their adhikar yes um, we speak about uh, humility we're speaking about humility before before krishna before god and um, obviously that plays out in a broader sense also in relation to other things and people, but it's focused on humility before God. And for example, to do God's work, to do Krishna's bidding, if you will, to act in ways that are pleasing to Krishna, favorable for bhakti, um, may in some instance uh, cause one to speak very strongly and, and, and sound very proud, so to speak. Um, uh, so uh, I think it's important to underscore the fact that humility before Krishna and his teachings may play out in the world in such a way that people question whether someone is humble or not. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur gave a famous lecture during uh, a, a ceremony which was uh, celebrating his appearance in the world, his birth in the world. And um, he lectured on, on this verse, said, I'm sitting here above everybody else. I may not look very humble, but I'm doing this on the order of Mahaprabhu and my guru and so forth. So um, <clears throat> that's important to just kind of put in place uh, humility before God doesn't mean we're going to fold our hands if a tiger attacks us and just be in, 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 in the name of being humble, right? So we have to have a dynamic idea, theological understanding of, of humility. Um, yes, and I have mentioned that um, it's helpful uh, to have a balanced psychology um, in the context of pursuing uh spiritual life and pursuing bhakti it's not essential you can make progress from any stage but the progress should show up mm -hmm. if, for example in terms of bringing about that uh that balance mm -hmm. in due course so if bhakti enters the the heart and does the cleansing work, some of that cleansing work may involve removing the influences of Tamaguna and, and Rajaguna or the extent to which one is, so, so, so speak, out of balance. I think I referred to the Varn Ashram system the other day in de dealing with this question. And I made the point that whether one is a Sudra that's primarily influenced by Tamaguna, according to the system, or a, 
or a Vaishya influenced by Tamaguna and Rajaguna and so on. Um, um, if one acts according to the system and embraces one's conditioning that shows up in the form of a disposition and, uh, and, and propensities to act and so forth, and then does so with an idea that ultimately I'm working for the, for the center, for the pleasure of Vishnu, the heart of, this, of, this, of the social religious system, then that constitutes being in sattva, in a sense, in, a, in that kind of balance. So, um, so if one's arguably, if one is out of balance, then bhakti can help to bring us in balance and then and enable us to go vertically, to grow vertically. So um, if she doesn't have to do as much cleansing work, then she can do more decorating work, if you will. Um, but she functions on, on, on both levels. So uh, that said, in relation to your, to your question, <clears throat> I think that the, the great uh, uh, souls who have expressed um, humility in their poetry mm -hmm. um, is that that expression is an outgrowth of their actually coming before um, Bhagwan coming within the proximity, if you will, through consciousness of Bhagawan and the natural um, experience that derives from that, that I'm a finite, I'm infinitesimal, he's infinite. Mm -hmm. That I'm coming, the closer I come, the, the infinitesimal comes to the infinite, the more it feels what it means to be infinitesimal. Mm -hmm. As if I may be infinitesimal, but I may not be in proximity to the infinite, so I may, have, may not have a clear perception of myself. Mm -hmm. But if I come close to the infinite, then I can understand that what it means that I'm infinitesimal and experience it. And so this is a, this is, this is a result of that mm -hmm. coming close to coming within the proximity of the infinite, coming before the infinite, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, uh, feeling small, feeling embarrassed by his infinite magnanimity, kindness, his infinite love, mm -hmm. and my limited capacity to express the same in relation to him in comparison. Mm -hmm. um, and so that being the case, that those statements and prayers are coming out of that spiritual experience we should not conflate them hmm, with um, a material sense of um, lacking or um, well, lack of self-esteem um, and, and other such things which are considered a psychological uh, neurosis, if you will, and, and, and being out of balance. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, where then, what, what is our, uh, it, let's take the Shikshastakam. There's really three stages of humility that are described there. The first stage of humility comes in the second verse, where Mahaprabhu says, I'm embarrassed, I have an arthas or other values that I uh, embrace. And even though I know theoretically they're, they're ephemeral, they're here today, they're gone tomorrow. Um, and, and even though Harinam, the holy name of Krishna is so full of all his shakti and his power, and it comes to me without any prerequisite on my part other than faith as, a, as an act of grace from, 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 from Bhagawan. 
comes to me in the form of his name and uh, he affords me the capacity to do uh, nam um, bhajan to chant the names um, without requiring any other rules or regulations necessarily being in place. He speaks about the magnanimity, the kindness, the, the generosity of Krishna in the form of his name and the fact that he's not attracted to it nonetheless because he has these false values. So he's feeling humble in that way, some lacking in himself. Um, but again, even there, the lacking that he feels in himself is in relation to the kindness, the comparison to the greatness of Bhagawan. Mm -hmm. So that's healthy. Mm -hmm. I feel small in relation to the greatness of Bhagawan. Doesn't mean I have to beat myself up in, in, in every situation, mm -hmm. which would again be more of a psychological uh, neurosis. Second stage of humility, Mahabharata was actually coming in the vicinity of of the absolute in the next verse, Trinada, peace, and Ichena, Nishta. And um, so he's having, you know, beginning to have the experience that the Acharyas are uh, writing about. The last stage is not mentioned per se, but the last stage of Shikshastakam is, in terms of humility, is Prem in separation and in union. And if we go to Brihad Bhagavatamrita, we find that Prem in separation and union fosters humility and humility fosters prame and at that stage the two are, are almost almost synonymous so different uh, kind of stages of, of humility but again it's all centered on bhagavan and and um, and and uh, the stages are determined by 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 progress and experience that um, is derived from that. So um, I think you have to look at those expressions in that way and differentiate them from a kind of a, of a humility that is feeling bad about oneself, which is very self-centered. Mm -hmm. Just see me, I'm not good enough. I'm this, I'm, you're just thinking about, about yourself. <laughs> I'm this, I'm that, you know, I, it's, it's thinking about what Bhagawan is brings about a natural humility. Thinking too much about oneself um, can foster pride or can foster humility or a, a, an appearance of humility. That's really a self-centeredness, um, seeking attention, you know, bringing attention to oneself, one's material sense of self. So it's like uh, material happiness is just one side of the, of the coin. If you flip it over, it's material distress. So kind of a, just a material sense of humility, if you will, that, 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 that constitutes psychological neurosis or dysfunctionality and so forth. Even from, a, even from an ordinary point of view, isn't, isn't really humility. It's, it's, it's about bringing attention to oneself. Um, so those are some thoughts. Does that help? Oh, yes. Thank you very much, Maharaj. That uh, yeah, was very comprehensive and uh, very helpful. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you for your question. So the question became six now. So we have five more. Okay. Uh, there is uh, Chaitanya Charan in the Spanish language. If Shamasundar can translate it, please. And maybe Guru Maharaj, you can briefly repeat it because some mm -hmm. people can't hear the translators. He sent it is the last message. You say, yeah. I can't hear Shamsun. Can you? Oh, uh, Gurmarsh, can you go? Can you go in the English channel, Gurmarsh? And then you can. You can probably hear. I'm in the English channel now. Yes, I can.
Yeah, well, the, the, okay. He asked questions about the five samskaras given at the time of initiation. Um, this is something that uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur draws on uh, Baldivinusan for. And um, uh, that said, and before going into it, there are different uh, descriptions of what's involved in or the procedures that surround initiation. Um, for example, in Hari Bhakti Vilas, I think you're given three different possibilities. Do it like this, if not like that, do it like this, if not like that, do it like this. Um, so they, 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 there's some relativity with regard to the details surrounding the the, the ritual or essentially the heart of the affair, which is imparting of the mantra from the heart of the guru into the ear and into the heart of the, of the student. Um, and in different vicinities, different things may not be available that would otherwise be auspicious and uh, included in the ritual. Um, and so on and so forth. But, but having given one, and I think two, and then maybe a third in Hari Bhakti Vilas, Rupa Goswami says, if nothing else, just impart the mantra. That's what it's really all about. Um, it reminds me of when we installed the Krishna Balaram deities in, um, in Krishna Balaram Mandir in Vrindavan, which was a three day affair of Brahmins coming and performing all types of rituals. And, and every now and then there would be a role for the Acharya. So Prabhupada would come out of his room and say something or do something and go back into his room. And uh, when it was completed, we performed Nam Siddhan Kirtan and the deities were established on the altar. And Prabhupada said afterwards, actually all that was for show, just by the Nam Siddhan Kirtan, everything was complete. Um, so, uh, I just bring this up in a broader, uh, to, to broaden the context hmm? that we may not be focused on details as being essential and without this, it's not in place or that and, um, uh, and so forth. Um, you know, we want to bring attention to the event so that the student will think something's happening. Hmm? <laughs> um, even though something's happening, if he, he or she doesn't think so, because not enough people are there or not enough, you know, um, ritualistic uh, elements are uh, uh, in place and so forth. But uh, yes, these five have been um, mentioned, I believe, by Baladi Bidusan and picked up on by Bhakti Minotak when he wrote a short essay about it. And those, I, don't, I mean, I don't even know if I can remember, but I'll try. Usually when I'm giving initiation, I, I ask for help. But uh, um, it, it, Nam and Shamsundra can help me perhaps. Uh, uh, Urva, Urva Pundra, um, Tapa, uh, Yagya, and I guess Mantra would be the fifth. Or then in English, uh, Urdva, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, you froze just a few seconds, but now we can hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, so Urdva Pundra means tea log. Mm -hmm. And Tapa means, well, it means austerity, it means um, penance, uh, by extension, it can mean knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll go into that a little bit. And then um, nam um, means that the disciples given the name, Krishna Das, Krishna Dasi. Um, uh, yagya would be um, uh, I suppose you could say um, a license is given to participate in the uh, Seva Puja. Mm -hmm. 
um, and mantra means the mantra that's imparted. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Urdhva Pundra is the vertical tilak as opposed to the horizontal tilak that the Shaivites wear. It's obviously the um, a, uh, a sign by which one externally acknowledges, proclaims, I'm a devotee of Vishnu, of Krishna. Um, and within the different sects of Vaishnavism, they have different tilak. Within the Gaudi of Vaishnavism, there are different paribars or lineages coming from Nityananda, coming from Advaita, coming from Gadadhar, and they have their different tilak um, and so on and so forth. So it's identif an identifying mark. It's, it's also included in, um, in Rag Bhakti, uh, mentioned both by uh, uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur and Raghavart Machandrika, and also by um, uh, Dhyan Chandra Goswami in his Padati. Um, I believe uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur listed as something uh, Bhava Nukul, which is favorable for the Bhava. Um, obviously, it, it, it reminds other, it, it informs other people that we're, our body is, a, we're seeing it as a temple of Vishnu, and it reminds us as well as they see it and they deal with us accordingly. Um, and um, uh, it's, of course, we know under with Tilak, and in, in various places of the body, they're said to be presided over by different. Uh, uh, forms of, of Vishnu and their their names are recited as we as we apply the the uh, the tilak. So uh, Urdhva Pundra Tapa Tapa uh, in other sampradayas the Tapa would be to brand the devotee with a like a branding iron with the symbols of Vishnu, like see people brand cattle sometimes um, to identify them as being part of their their farm. That's a, that's a custom in the West anyway. Um, so uh, we don't do that. Uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was more generous. So typically we um, uh, may imprint, again, using tilak or sandalwood paste, the name of uh, Krishna. Mm -hmm. And that's how I apply that. Mm -hmm. I give the tilak and then I take the stamp like a metal or a wooden stamp and put in the tea log and stamp the body with the name of Krishna. Um, so, so Urdhva Pundra, uh, Tapa, Nama, when we impart a name, where the disciples identified as servant of Krishna um, and impart the mantra. Mm -hmm. And uh, relative to, if, if it's, if we're giving the, Mantra Diksha, then there might be some um, some explanation about Archan Marg um, Yogya, or of course, if we're giving uh, uh, we can look at another way. Yogya Namsan Kirtan should should the, the affair should be um, capped off with Namsan Kirtan. Hmm? That's the Yogya of Kali Yuga. So there's some, these are some ways to think about these, these items. But the main function is to impart uh, the mantra, to impart the name, give a blessing for chanting the holy name, so forth. Mm -hmm. Next question. Nick, you can ask your question. Pranam, Pranam is Maharaj. Um, my question is related Can't to you. Oh. Can't hear you. Greg, are you in English channel? Yeah, yes, I am. Oh, I was. Now I can hear you. I'm sorry. I was on the English channel. I don't know what happened there. Pronounced in Um, uh, Can you please share something about Adhikar? Um, um, in particular, what determines it? And is it related at all to Dharma? Well, Adhikar means uh, like qualification eligibility so different people have different um, levels of 
qualification to uh, participate in um, bhakti, which has a beginning stage, sadhana bhakti, an interim stage of perfection called bhava bhakti, and perfection itself, prema bhakti. Hmm. So uh, if one doesn't have adhikar for bhava bhakti, then one's not going to conduct oneself as one would if one had adhikar, had attained hmm, the qualification through bhakti itself, been qualified to experience bhava, hmm, uh, which then would call on the disciple to engage um, himself or herself in ways that they could not effectively do so in sadhana bhakti. Hmm. Um, uh, we find uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu setting an example for us. He was a public figure. He preached widely. He did Damsan Kirtan. Hmm. And through the medium of that, that kind of practice, um, he was turned into a private person, forced by the power of that. Hmm. Um, and then he began uh, conducting himself differently, hmm, although within the context of bhakti, because he, he had gained adhikar, hmm, uh, eligibility for a higher level, if you will, of, of, of practice, if you, can, if you can call it that. Hmm. Um, um, and his bhakti, of course, is driven by emotion and spontaneous and so forth, rather than by, I should do this because it's the right thing to do, or my guru has told me to, um, um, which is more relative to, uh, to sadhana bhakti. Hmm. So, uh, 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 we find another example, books that have been written often speak about in, in their Mangala Charn and their beginning auspicious invocation, who this is, who's eligible to read this, who's not. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so that's another example. So a book about bhakti, someone who doesn't have regard for bhakti, who's just a jnani uh, or a materialist and they wouldn't have eligibility to really understand it, to enter into it, to, to really connect with it and so forth. So that's the general idea. I mean, the broad sense of adhikar for bhakti is that if one has faith in the efficacy of bhakti and what bhakti is, as explained in the Shastra, one is qualified to take up the path, even though they may be ineligible on other levels in terms of what's required for other transcendental paths like yoga and jnana which speaks of their weakness hmm? in comparison to bhakti that doesn't require that you have that much eligibility hmm? to practice, but merely faith. You need faith to practice yoga that's going to work. You need faith to practice gyan, but you need more. You have to pass, pass through, according to the Gita, of, of nishkam karma yoga, nishkam karma. You have to have passed through that to become a jnani. Hmm? Um, so, uh, Bhakti is more generous and more powerful. So the fact that we may be less qualified to pursue transcendence than someone who has passed through Nishkam Karma and, and so forth, who can immediately take up Bhakti, um, speaks of her power, her generosity and her power. Of course, Bhakti is Nirguna rather than driven by Sattva Guna, which the paths of Yoga and Gyan are driven by. So those are some thoughts about eligibility. Hope that helps. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shem. Okay. Shama Sundar, can you read the message, the questions from Govinda Dasi? Um, it's 
și rog pregunta de Nahuel, Argentina, pare Cristina. So if I understand it, the question is that uh, in some institutions, devotees are living in a very insular type of environment and they're not encouraged or they're even led to believe it's wrong to voice an opinion that's different than the group uh, think and understanding and, and because other Gaudiya sects may have a different understanding of the same subject, slightly or a nuanced understanding, they're then um, isolated from those other groups as well. So what can one do to help such devotees break out of such an insular um, perspective and you know the, the guilt that comes with that and the uh, the uh, black and white thinking and 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 quite clearly the, the sectarianism that this this fosters i believe that's that is the question well i think that um some devotees flourish in that type of an environment in the beginning hmm? um Weak faith, it is said, requires an enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes Prabhupada preached in a way that might foster that kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. He was once asked about that by um, Dr. Kapoor, mm -hmm. his godbrother. And uh, he was told, uh, and, and Dr. Kapoor, he said this could be a problem going forward. Your disciples won't listen to anybody else, even though somebody else like me might have something to say to them. I can see that, you know, I can advise them in some instances that they've misunderstood and so forth on something. So Prabhupada said, well, no, it's not like that. I have, uh, what I've done is I planted a seed of a tree and I put a fence around the tree to protect it. Like here, we have many deer. If you plant a Japanese maple tree, then in the early days of that sapling, the, the deer will come and eat it, the leaves and hinder um, its growth. So you put a fence around it. Hmm? But Prabhupada said, in time, hmm, if it grows healthy, then the tree will overflow the fence. And even some deer take a few leaves. It's not a big deal. It's strong enough to even gen and generous enough to be able to, to uh, afford that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was his idea. Not therefore that they would stay in that position forever. So that's a good analogy to bring up to such devotees that Prabhupada himself um, cited, um, and. Um, um, at the same time as I began, some devotees are comfortable with, with that. 
because of the stage that they're at, those who are starting to feel uncomfortable with it, then maybe those are the persons, the type of devotees that you're talking about and how to help them. The other type who's comfortable with it, you're probably not gonna to get too far trying to help them. When they start to feel uncomfortable with that, and then they're growing, they're starting to grow wings a little bit, then, then they're in a position where they're in you know, more of a teachable um, moment. And then of course, the best way to teach is, is, is by your own example. But um, it may be also possible to point out to them how Prabhupada, for example, if you're talking about, let's say, the ISKCON society, which, which tends to be insular, um, um, and, uh, you know, at least they uh, tout the idea that they're exclusively devoted uh, to Prabhupada. I think that there are ways, even within Prabhupada's books, to point out to them that Prabhupada has also shown what he's talking about when he talks about this tree overflowing the branches and so forth, because he, he may have made statements, you only have to read my books, don't read any other books, and so on and so forth. Uh, you can show how he said other things hmm, to, to the exact contrary. In the opening purport of the first verse of the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, he says students would do well to read the commentaries of Vishwana Chakritakras, Nathan Goswami, Jiva Goswami, and so on and so forth. So you can find an endorsement of a more inclusive perspective within Prabhupada's own words, his own writing, in his own books that could then be presented to such devotees. Hmm? And, and, and they could see that Prabhupada himself is speaking about that. And so you make the obvious point using this analogy. Well, some statements were made for those who needed a fence around. Other statements were being made for those who, who are growing healthy and they're starting to feel uncomfortable with the fence. Hmm? Well, the fence is, is, is a, it's provisional. It's provisional. Hmm? It's good that you're feeling uncomfortable with the fence. Hmm? And now here is insight in the texts and the writings and words of Prabhupada himself that support that hmm? and how he himself conducted himself. Hmm? And, um, and, you know, and the, the fact that um, he had friends hmm? and what he said about them, how he interacted with them, how he described Pujapat Sridhar for example, as his Sikshu Guru. Hmm? how he regarded him. Hmm? He criticized him in one letter, but in six or eight others, he praised him and, and many other statements and he lived with him for many years. And so, so he, you know, they're, if they're already in a position where they're feeling a little uncomfortable with the fence, then you help them with uh, statements from Prabhupada himself. That's what I would uh, uh, suggest. And just, just kind of common sense and an emphasis on the fact that they that they're not meant to be non-thinking people. Spiritual life is not meant to think for you, but to teach you how to think. It's more than more than teaching you what to think. It's about how to think about what I've taught you, how to think about it. So there's a you have to apply your intelligence also in Krishna consciousness, not that you turn it off hmm, altogether. Now, at a certain point, it may be good to turn it off and just listen, but at a certain point, you have to turn it on and think about the implications. And it's very important, you can explain to them, it's very important that we do this in order to ultimately to strengthen our faith. We have to put the metal of our faith in the fire, in the blacksmith's fire, if you will, like steel, to the point where it's about to melt and bring it out, then it will become stronger. So examine your faith with your intellect. Examine what you do, what you've been told to do with your intellect and understand the why of it, the purpose of it. So it's very important that we don't become 
trapped in, in doing, engaged in practices without the reasoning of why, why we're doing them. Chant 16 rounds every day. So is it like, there's nothing to think about. You just mechanically do the 16, it's done, finished, okay. Or is there a purpose to sit for a couple of hours and focus exclusively? Are you doing that or are you just, you know, counting? Are you chanting or are you counting? Mm -hmm. um, and when you start to think like that, you realize you could count less and chant more and, and, and still be. It, so you have to become, you have to fly. You have to fly. Mm -hmm. uh, you, nobody's going to flap the wings for you. The practice will help you to grow wings, and then you're going to have to fly a little bit. But and yeah, you might you might fall down, but you, you know you can get up and go again. I don't mean to, we're recommending that you go forward such a way that you make a fall down, but you, but uh, but um, uh, there is a struggle um, to uh, connect the heart with the head. Mm -hmm. So, so you have a simple heart, faith, and bhakti. Then you think about it, uh, to the implications of it, and so forth. And to, to, the idea is to make the faith stronger, so you understand the meaning, the purpose, the substance over the over the form. So this is something that um, that uh, devotees who are feeling a little uncomfortable with the fence, that's a good sign, and they can hear this. It's kind of thing to some extent. And, and as I say, in an easy way, in a user-friendly way, you could point it out to them. Here it is, even in Prabhupada's books, the saying this, if this now is relevant for you. Hmm? Previously, you didn't even see it was there because it wasn't relevant for you. You didn't need it. You read it, didn't, it didn't register with you. Now look at it. Does it register with you? Does it make sense? Something like that. Hope that helps. Thank you. Now, uh, there's another question from the Spanish uh, speaking devotees. If Shama Sundar can translate uh, the one from Braja Hari, does? Both, uh, so the question is about Tulsi, and there's a Ram Tulsi, which is tends to be green, and a and a, and a Krishna Tulsi, which tends to be purplish, blackish, bluish. Um, and in a, in, in a letter to Govinda Dasi many years ago, Prabhupada's disciple Govinda Dasi Prabhupada, wrote, there's no difference. There's no difference between Ram and Krishna. They're both Vishnu, so there's no difference between either. Ram Tulsi or the Krishna Tulsi, both should be anyone, either one should be offered, something like that. But the question is, there is ultimately a difference theologically between Ram, Ram Lila, Ram, Ram Loka, you know, Go, uh, Ayodhya and, and Krishna Loka, Goloka. Um, they are different persons, and um, even, brother, even though they're the same in Tattva, both Vishnu Tattva. And so, is there any way in which one could look at an affinity for one Tulsi over another re relative to one's deity, um, so forth. So, first of all, of course, uh, these are different strands of the sacred basil or Tulsi that grow in Vrindavan. And um, uh, I've never seen any practice in Vrindavan that distinguishes between one or the other in terms of offering to Krishna. So Ram, Tulsi, uh, 
uh, Krishna Tulsi are both offered to Krishna. But there may be, from the point of view of a practitioner, hmm, a sense that I will, I'm a worshiper of Krishna. I will grow only Tulsi Krishna, or Krishna Tulsi, and offer that to the deity. And if that is that fosters affection for Krishna, then it's uh, it's something that that. I think I lost you. I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes, Gurmaraj, thank you. You lost me for a second. So it's, I'm, I'm gonna say, say it's not a rule. It's not an absolute. It's not a problem. If you offer a Ram Tulsi to Krishna or a Krishna Tulsi to Ram, hmm, both fine as Prabhupada said. But for an individual, if offering and growing and caring for Krishna Tulsi's as opposed to Ram Tulsi's and making a conscious choice like that, um, and then offering only Krishna Tulsi's to, to Krishna is something that fosters in that sadhaka more devotion, feeling for Krishna and so forth, then, it, then it, it's acceptable. But it's not like a rule, it's not like an absolute, but it, it, it may be an attitude that is not, is not objectionable. Hmm? And if, it, if one finds it helpful, then there's a place for that. Hmm? So there's the last question from Indra Bahia. She wrote on the chat, Haribol dear Maharaj, in Srimad Bhagavatam, it is written that Lord Shiva was born from Lord Brahma. But isn't Shiva actually much older than that? As in, uh, and she's quoting, Shiva is eternal while the post of Brahma is constantly changing. Brahmas. Um, how was Lord Shiva really born, if at all? Thank you so much. Right. Shiva is a manifestation of um, a transformation of Vishnu. And um, there are different at the same time, manifestations of Shiva. Hmm? So with regard to the Shiva born from Brahma, hmm? um, it doesn't mean that um, that particular manifestation of Shiva born from, from Brahma is the whole story hmm? on Shiva. It's a particular manifestation of Shiva for, for functions within the world. Mm -hmm. In the world, you know, he's eternal, right? Mm -hmm. um, he has no, no birth. So we can look at, uh, at, at, at Shiva in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, so we have the overarching Shiva as Mahavishnu or um, Mahasankarshan, Maha no, not Mahasankarshan. Um, uh, what is the term? Um, uh, Sadashiva, Sadashiva, kind of the fullest manifestation of Shiva. And then there are the Rudras, and uh, I think there's several of those types and the, the, them. And there are the different manifestations of Shiva. But overall, yes, you're correct. Shiva is not a product of Brahma, who is in uh who who is uh whose position is subject to demise so brahma brahma's die shiva's position is, is different in that regard still he may appear from brahma in some circumstances for certain purposes that are fulfilled in the world by shiva tattva that's not the only thing that shiva tattva does Ultimately, Shiva Tattva is, as, as Sadashiva is at his own abode, and there he's a worshiper of, of, uh, of Vishnu. Mm -hmm. And that's beautifully described in, in Sanatana Goswami's Brihad Bhagavatam Rita. So, I think we've covered all the questions for today. No? Yes, we did. Um, Somebody says, 
What about the manifestation of Lord Shiva that is known as Triparari? I never heard of him. I don't know anything about him. No, I know a little something about him. Yes. The manifestation of Shiva known as Triparari is a manifestation of Shiva. Can you hear me? Manifestation of Shiva at a time in which Shiva is empowered by Krishna. Tri Pur Ari. Tri means three, Pur means city, Ari means enemy. So story in the Bhagavatam, and it's in other texts as well, is that uh, I believe it's in the eighth canto. Uh, Maya Dhanava manifested three cities and was attacking, and uh, and so the demigods were in 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 distress. They called on Shiva. Shiva came and he was empowered by Krishna to deal with three, the three poor. Adi means enemy. He became the enemy of the three cities. He defeated them. Hmm. He defeated Maya Donava. Hmm. Uh, but the significant feature of Shiva that in that particular instance gave him the power was the power invested in him by Krishna. Prabhupada told me that your name is Triparari, so hmm. he told that told me that story once in private on his veranda in Mayapur. And so he said, therefore, you should defeat all the demons. <laughs> he said, but by preaching, by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, not by fighting. Hmm. So what else? Any other lingering thoughts or questions or comments? Shamananda has something. How do you well? Um, so you have explained that uh, Vishramba is the Pradhan of Sakyarasa. And I was wondering if you could say so something about the, the Pradhan of the other Rasas. Uh, well, that might take a while. Um, um, I don't think it's time to go into that. Not, not, neither have I taken the time to thoroughly educate myself on that, nor am I sure that the term has been used by any Acharya to uh, distinguish um, in that way a characteristic of a particular rasa. Um, that said, as I think about it here on the fly, if you will, in the teaching, I believe, of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Rupa Goswami and Chaitanya Charitamrita, you're going to find an explanation of the different rasas and how that which is in Shantarasa is also in Dasiras, but something more is there. And now that which is in Dasiras hmm, is essentially hmm, in Sakiras, but something more. So the something more is the Vishramba. Hmm, is that uh, feeling that does away with the reverence, for example, that we find in Dasya, it causes some separation between the object of love and service and the servitor. Mm -hmm. So in, in Dasya Bhakti, Dasya Rasa, there's some regard for the deity that's, that is absolutely not present in, in the full face of, of, of Sakya Rasa. So it's 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 characteristic it's that intimacy so if you go now go backward to dasyaras and you look at that which distinguishes it from santaras shantaras you could call that the pradhan hmm, arguably of dasyaras now if you go forward which is questionable whether you should take what's all as as a third or put it in the second position uh, there are different ways to think about that but if you go 
according to, as is explained to Chaitanya Charitamrita, you, you go to Sakura, from Sakuras to Dasuras, then the ingredients there are there, but the, there's something more. So there's a sense of, uh, I don't forget what the term is in Vatsali Rasa, but that overriding protective um, feeling, you know, to, toward, towards Bhagawan. And then if you go to, so that would be uh, comparatively the Pradhan of Vatsali Rasa. And then you go from there to Madhurya in that way. Now it's important to note um, in this description that Rupa Goswami is not saying that anyone in Dasi Rasa has at his or her disposal the entire experience of Shantarasa or anyone in Vatsali Rasa has the entire experience of, at will, of Dasya and Vatsalya, or Dasya and, and Shanta, or anyone in Madhuri Rasa has all the Rasas within them. Therefore, he gives an example hmm, to clarify uh, what he's saying. Hmm. And he gives the example of the five elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether. So uh, in ether, there is sound. In air, there's sound and what touch. In water, there's sound, touch, and taste. Hmm. In fire, there's sound, touch, taste, and what? Sight? No, sound, touch, taste. What's the, anyway. Yeah, yeah. sight. <laughs> Yeah, oh, but, but you could see water. And then, then and there's sound, touch, taste, and sound, touch, taste, I'm missing one. Sound, touch, two, taste, sound, touch, taste, smell, and the ether. Anyway, in, 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 in earth, all of them are there. Mm -hmm. We do like sound, touch, taste, sight and smell. So all five are in earth, but it's not that if you're holding earth, let's say, you have the experience of holding water. Although there is water in earth. So in Madhurya Rasa, for example, it's not that you just decide, I think I'll taste Sakya Rasa because that's within me and now I'm gonna be a sucker. No. But some some aspect of sake is also is also is also present and something more. Mm -hmm. But each one is complete in itself. So it's not that in Madhurya Rasa, well, uh, if he wants to taste sake rasa, he can go there. And therefore, it said, well, if, if Radharani wants to taste sake rasa, that's too all kind of a kaya viewa male form of, of uh, if you will, of, of uh, you could say, of, of uh, manifest as Subal, just as she has manifestations of different aspects of herself that are different gopis and so forth. So, so that's the way I think you look at the distinguishing characteristic of each rasa. Uh, it's not the Rupa Goswami has it, and the Pradhan of Vatsali is this, but that distinguishing character is the same. That, that's what he's talking about. Thank you for the question. Okay. Thank you all. Nice to be with you. Hope to be with you again next week. Sheila Guru Maharaj Ki. See you next week. Um, so we have the announcement to say. Um, tomorrow there won't be class from uh, Swami Padmanabha Maharaj and uh, because he finished his series on Tuesday we have Krishan Gidasi and uh, she will give her uh, last class on the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita when in doubt read chapter two which is very wonderful so you should all attend. Then on Wednesday, we have Tulal Chandra Das that continues with his classes on Krishna Sandarbha 
um, another wonderful series. On Tuesday, Archana Sidi will uh, interview Braja Sundari from Madhuvan uh, for the Sadaka's Journey series. And on Friday, it will be the 1st of October. So we change the class series. We will start with Shamananda. He will uh, start his series on the life of Swami Bhaktivedanta Tripurari. On Saturday, Ashram Maharaj will start his new series, How Great is Bhakti? Exploring the Reach of a Powerful Force. And next Sunday, there will be the Swami call again. So thank you, everyone. I would just like to remind all of you, if you have questions during the Swami call, uh, please just come a few minutes before he gets online. So it's just more easy for those who host the call to, to have the question. Thank you again, Haribo, and see you. See? Can you hear me? Oh, yes, please. Uh, did you, thank you. Very kind. I sent you a question on the I sent oh, you a question sorry. in the chat. Um, these recordings, oh. these, these satsangs of Maharaj are so incredibly valuable, mm. so meaningful, and so memorable. I was wondering if um, there's some place on uh, they are posted that one can either hear or re-see uh, uh, these particular uh, 